integrity, openness, confidence in government that we so sorely need in Washington today. The next president of the United States, my husband, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> We're going to make uh, the jobs in this state very, very easy. We're going to take over that border, and we're going to make it. We had the most secure border in our history. I hereby pardon Liberty Ann Bell. Hello, I'm Nancy Cordes in Washington, D.C. Welcome to America Decides, a new move to try to stem the flow of migrants into the U.S. Sources tell CBS News, the Biden administration is planning to deploy U.S. immigration officials to Panama to help local authorities screen and deport migrants. Central American country is a key transit point for people who are hoping to reach the southern border of the U.S. The Department of Homeland Security has identified a team that will be dispatched there once a final agreement is reached. This year alone, more than 450, rather, thousand migrants have crossed a rugged jungle that connects Panama with South America called the Darien Gap. That is a major increase compared to last year, according to Panamanian government data. CBS News immigration reporter Camilo Montoya Galvez broke this story, and he joins us now from Mission, Texas. Hi to you, Camilo. Explain to us how exactly this would work. If you've got 500,000 people crossing the Darien Gap, it seems like you'd need to send hundreds of U.S. agents to even make a dent in that flow of humans heading north. That is a critical question, Nancy. U.S. officials tell CBS News that the Department of Homeland Security has already internally identified a team of asylum officers and deportation agents who will be sent to Panama to help that Central American country screen migrants for humanitarian protection and also to deport those who don't qualify. And it is part of an effort to reduce the flow of migrants into the notorious Darien Gap, Nancy. That is that jungle, a once impenetrable jungle, I should underscore, that divides Panama and Colombia. And it is now a major transit route for hundreds of thousands of migrants hoping to reach the U.S., almost half a million people have crossed that jungle, including about 50 percent of them being children and women this year alone on foot. That is a, a once unthinkable number, Nancy, for this jungle where many years this was unpenetrable. And mm -hmm. it is an illustration, Nancy, this effort is that the Biden administration is willing to take unprecedented initiatives to try to reduce these unprecedented levels of migration here along the U.S.-Mexico border. In just fiscal year 2023, Border Patrol recorded over 2 million migrant apprehensions here. That is only the second time in U.S. history that that has ever happened, Nancy. Uh, yeah, recognition, obviously, that they need to do something differently, Camillo. But how exactly would this work? I mean, these uh, migrants are walking through this thick jungle, as you pointed out. They're not uh, walking through Panama City and stopping in at a U.S. government office. So how exactly would they, um, you know, would they apprehend these individuals? And then what would they do? Just say, you know, OK, you get to continue on your journey and you need to go back to your home country? Well, once migrants get out of the Darien jungle on foot, they are typically encountered by United Nations officials and Panamanian officials. The objective of this operation, Nancy, is to have those Panamanian officials screen these migrants, stop them, and decide whether or not they qualify for protection in Panama. And if they don't qualify for asylum in Panama, then the U.S. goal is to have those migrants deported to their home countries like Venezuela. And again, it is designed to reduce that flow into Central America before the migrants reach the U.S.-Mexico border. This is really interesting. What uh, does the uh, Panamanian government think about this? Why are they willing to cooperate with the U.S. in this way? And, and which of the migrants, migrants from which countries would be most likely to be allowed to continue on? It's another critical question, Nancy. I was told by U.S. officials that the Panamanian 
Panamanian government, I should say, requested this assistance specifically. They asked the U.S. for money, for employees and staffing and resources to bolster its deportation efforts because in fiscal year 2012, Panama only saw about 2,000 migrants cross the Darien jungle. Now it is half a million. So the migration flows into that country have changed dramatically, and that's why that country is now requesting this help. In terms of who will be affected by this operation, Nancy, it will most likely be Venezuelan migrants. The vast majority of the migrants crossing the Darien jungle are from Venezuela, about 90 percent of them. And so many of these migrants are leaving that economic crisis in Venezuela. And this is yet another effort that the administration has taken to reduce the flow of migration from Venezuela. I think you can recall, Nancy, that just a few weeks ago, the Biden administration started sending deportation flights to Venezuela for the first time in U.S. history. It's a really intriguing notion. It'll be fascinating to watch and see if it works. Camilo Montoya Galvez uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you so much. Tributes are pouring in for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. She died in her home in Plains, Georgia, on Sunday at the age of 96. The former First Lady was instrumental in shaping the role of the president's spouse. She championed research into mental health during her time at the White House, and she was also a trusted advisor to her husband, former President Jimmy Carter. Both of them were awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1999. Well, Jim and I have been, um, have had um, great opportunities. We've been very privileged. The American people have given us unlimited chances, unlimited opportunities. During a speech at the White House today, President Biden spoke about her legacy. We'll also think about the loved ones we lost, including just yesterday when we lost former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who walked her own path, inspiring a nation and the world along the way. Historian and documentarian Andrew Oak joins us now. Andrew, not only do you study uh, First Ladies, but you also knew Rosalind Carter. So I'm wondering uh, what this weekend was like for you and, and, and what you're thinking about when you think about Rosalind Carter. Well, I'm, I'm sad, like everyone else, at the loss, but more so I'm not necessarily mourning. I'm celebrating a life, a life of 96 years of love with President Carter and 96 years of service to the American people and people all over the globe. She did unprecedented things that other First Ladies hadn't touched yet and brought some of the subjects like mental illness and things that we've talked about tirelessly. Uh, this is a woman who, who celebrated even a more uh, prolific post-White House life than nearly every other First Lady in history. And the advantage and the power of the Carters was the power of two, because they're virtually inseparable in life, personal and professional, and in their public service. How do you think she shaped the role of a First Lady, not just while uh, she was in office, but then the role of a First Lady or a First Couple once they leave office? Well, typically, a First Lady will pick a cause or a couple causes. Uh, Mrs. Carter seemed tireless. Of course, she started out with mental health, as we mentioned, and mental mm -hmm. health is a key because... No one else was talking about it at this point. It's kind of like right. Betty Ford was talking about breast cancer and addiction when people didn't talk about that. Mrs. Carter talked about a subject that was taboo, a subject that was in the closets, swept under the carpet. And by bringing that out in light and making it acceptable just to talk about, that would be enough. But she went on to be on board of directors and part of uh, 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 symposiums and associations with psychological and mental health and medical and journalistic writing of mental health. She really just stopped at nothing to get this issue out there and improved upon. And why was it that she grabbed onto that particular issue? I think it was something that she recognized that wasn't getting the attention that it needed and something that was very serious, mm -hmm. like addiction or cancer or something like that. But no one was championing this very, very important issue mm -hmm. that continues to plague us in society today. Right. And sh there would be no discussions about this like we're having today or help that we would have if Mrs. Carter hadn't opened up the door and started the conversation. And then, of course, all the humanitarian work that she and her husband did 
once they left office. Habitat for Humanity. I mean, we saw the Carters in not the best physical condition, still wearing tool belts and swinging hammers and wearing hard hats. I've been to Plains. I know the family. I know the, the community. I know the, the, the relatives. It's such a wonderful community, a wonderful town, and the support group down there that has always championed these efforts and pitched in. But this goes across the country. This goes around the globe of people that really could get on board because the, the Carters were so sincere and their work was walking the walk and talking the talk and, like I say, swinging the hammers and things like Habitat for Humanity. And that can't help but be infectious and you want to contribute and help given their efforts. I thought that Jimmy Carter's tribute was so lovely this weekend when he said that as long as she was alive, I knew that somebody loved me. And also uh, making sure to point out that all of his successes were her successes too, because she was there with him every step of the way. They're really, you know, I've studied every first lady, Martha Washington, through Dr. Jill Biden. And I've always tried to separate those women from their husband's accomplishments and take them on their own. There's no separating Rosalind and President Carter. Even now in death, they're still together. There, there's no separation here. And the two have been together 77 years married. But also, she supported all his efforts and his philanthropies and his political and personal aspirations. And he did the same for her, always giving each other credit for the work that each of them did on their own and then celebrating the work that they did together. And you knew her later in life. Talk a little bit about what that relationship was like and what her personality was like behind the scenes. One of the nicest ladies I've ever met, really. I, I, I was with her and the family on her birthday last year in Plains, Georgia. And I was honored to be able to give her a signed set of my books for her birthday. I, I gave her the book. She said, thank you so much. I told her a little bit about the C-SPAN project. She had done an interview for the C-SPAN series that I produced with a team of incredible people there at C-SPAN and the White House Historical Association. But the purpose of the event was to dedicate this butterfly statue, 18 butterflies on the statue, beautifully done by a sculptor named Peter Hazel, 18 to represent the 18th of August when she was born. And mm -hmm. her sister, Alethea, took her over with her walker to light the statue for the first time. I was just trying to stay out of the way. And as she was walking past lighting it, she looked over and saw me again. And she reached over and she grabbed my hand so tenderly, but firmly, still strong in her 90s, had a good grip on me and mm -hmm. said, thank you so much for being here. And I said, Mrs. Carter, thank you for so much and for everything that you've done and happy birthday. And she thanked me again. And then we enjoyed the rest of the barbecue together with the folks down there in Plains and, and had a lovely afternoon and evening together. Wow, that's a beautiful memory. So glad you got to have that experience with her last year. Andrew Oak, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us more about Rosalind Carter. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Nancy. You got it. Coming up next, we analyze the challenges facing President Biden's re-election bid and the latest from the Republican field with our panel. They're streaming America Decides. We'll be right back. And by the way, I, it's my birthday today, and they can actually sign birthdays. I just want you to know it's difficult turning 60. Welcome back to America Decides. That was President Biden poking fun at his own age as he turns 81 today. It comes as a new NBC poll finds the president's support among young voters dropped 15 percentage points since September. Deepa Shivram and Bracton Booker join us now to discuss. Deepa is a White House correspondent for NPR and Bracton is a national political correspondent for Politico. Welcome to you both. Let's start out by talking about this big drop in young voters, obviously a critical constituency for uh, Democrats in particular. Uh, Deepa, how much do you think this has to do with the fact that um, you know, this all com comes amid uh, tensions between Israel and Hamas and the president coming down firmly on the side of Israel. Yeah, this is definitely very much tied to that. I think this is a poll that has shown uh, for a while there's been a lack of enthusiasm among younger voters when it comes to Joe Biden. But as this uh, international uh, situation has unfolded, uh, there's a lot of criticism among young voters about how President Biden has sided with Israel unequivocally uh, and some has been a little bit late to the game. A lot of younger voters I've spoken to would say, uh, even talking about civilian casualties in Gaza, uh, something that he has been, they felt a little flippant 
uh, about in the past several weeks, maybe not paying as much attention to that, not focusing on that. We've seen protests around the country, large ones in D.C., large ones in other uh, places all over the United States where young voters are really turning up to say, you know, we don't agree with this administration. And, and now what we're seeing is polling to, to back that up. And so there is a really big gap uh, with how much younger voters in that demographic of 18 to 34 years old, as this poll pointed out, uh, in terms of how they feel about how the president has handled this crisis and versus how the White House is really moving forward with this. Bracton, what can the White House do to course correct? I mean, I've noticed that the president and everyone on down has been careful recently to say, you know, bombings at hospitals need to stop. We're very concerned about Palestinian civilians. In fact, in the White House briefing today, John Kirby point blank said there have been too many civilian casualties, which is something that they haven't mm -hmm. said that explicitly Before, yeah. until now. It does seem like they're trying to make a, a, a change here. Well, look, they're, they're trying to make a change, but I, I think what you need to see from, from this president is you need to see him get outside of Washington and take his message to the people. I mean, it, you talk about the protests happening. Uh, you're also seeing protests happening on, on college campuses where young voters mm -hmm. are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would think that the president will want to get out into the, into the field and have conversations with young voters and talk to them about what the administration is doing, right? Um, so far, we're not seeing that. We're seeing this kind of like bubble wrap of this president and make sure that he stays in the White House, make sure that they can control all, aspect, all aspects of the message right now. Right. And I don't think you can play it safe at this point uh, right. with seeing that the poll numbers are, are going south for this president. Right. The, the campaign clearly feels that they have time to get him out on the road and doing rallies and things like that. Does that suggest to you that they just aren't concerned about the possibility of um, a third party candidate like Joe Manchin or Robert F. Kennedy Jr. at all? I mean, I definitely think what you hear from the White House, what you hear from the campaign is is taking this question of, of Biden and his age and concerns about that and turning that into the word experience, right? Mm -hmm. That there couldn't be a better time to have Joe Biden as president of the United States and be reelected as president of the United States because of the vast experience he has dealing with foreign policy issues in particular, dealing with a lot of other domestic crises. This is something that, you know, in his years and years of public service in an elected office, he has dealt with. And so you hear the campaign trying to spin uh, that message that this is a president uh, who has a lot of experience doing these things, but clearly it's not lining up with uh, with certain people. His, his approval ratings overall definitely not as high as they uh, could be less than a year out from an election. Um, and so it's it's really interesting to see that balance of, of what the White House thinks is, uh, you know, their their best talking points moving forward and, and really where it's translating with voters. And I think it's also interesting to see how the White House is going to use Kamala Harris, the vice president, uh, right. in this right. talk board as, as she's been traveling to college campuses, as she's been trying to reach younger voters, how she'll be utilized uh, in her population popularity there as well. And Bracton, the White House keeps arguing, the campaign keeps arguing that people just aren't plugged in yet to politics right. and that once they realize that this is a binary choice between President Biden and former President Trump, that the, uh, co the choice will not be more stark and that people will come back to the president. Um, what do you make of that argument, especially as we see former President Trump say some really surprising things, even for him over the past couple of weeks. Um, the analysts have described as, as a foray into uh, fascism, oh, the yeah. way he's talking about, you know, rooting out anybody who doesn't agree with him, sicking the Justice Department on people mm -hmm. who are too popular or, or who don't uh, take the party line. Um, you know, is, is that kind of proving the Biden administration's point? I'm not sure it's proving the Biden administration's point right now, but I, I think Democrats will, will largely point to, we've been here before, right? You look yeah. back at 2011 when uh, Obama was running for re-election and there were polls that had Romney with him at, uh, in a dead heat and he was able to pull that out. Um, you know, I think they're saving grace and saying, hey, we're a year out. People are just starting to pay attention to uh, our elective politics. But what really is happening here is this is a referendum on, on the Biden administration. This is not really about Trump at this point. This is about right. what has Biden done for the American people? And is he delivering on the thesis of his uh, of his campaign that he mm -hmm. is the steady hand here? Right now, it is not proving out that he is the steady hand and that world leaders are just going to um, listen to everything that the the that President Biden is going to have is, is trying to say and try to guide them in certain directions. So right now. Biden has some some work to do, but there is time to to deliver on that message. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to watch, especially now that we know that there are debates scheduled for next year. We'll see if both <laughs> of <calendar>. those <laughs> candidates actually uh, show up to all three of them. Uh, Deepa, Bracton, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate Thanks it. Thank you.
An appeals court is weighing arguments over the gag order issued in Donald Trump's 2020 federal election subversion case. Attorneys for the former president and federal prosecutors faced off in front of a three-judge panel this morning for more than two hours. The gag order is currently on hold. It would prevent Trump and his lawyers from disparaging court personnel and potential witnesses. Trump has argued the gag order violates his constitutional rights. Well, there was no foul play at this year's presidential par turkey pardon. And get ready for more puns like that, because coming up, CBS News gets up close with an exclusive look at one of the lucky birds. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. The nation has enjoyed the presidential turkey pardon for more than three decades, and today was no different. The first documented White House turkey pardon was performed by President John F. Kennedy in 1963, but the tradition did not become an annual occurrence until 1989 under President George H.W. Bush. Since then, dozens of turkeys have been pardoned, at the White House, and the tradition continued today when two lucky ducks, I mean, lucky turkeys, named Liberty and Belle, were pardoned by President Biden on Monday afternoon on the South Lawn. Our colleague, Ed O'Keefe, another lucky duck, nabbed a coveted interview with one of the birds, along with the chairman of the National Turkey Federation, Steve Licken. So how on earth <laughs> is it that you got you and your birds here today uh, to be pardoned by the president. So as chairman of the National Turkey Federation, it is our honor to have this opportunity to raise the birds. So uh, these birds were hatched uh, in the first week of July. And so they're about 20 weeks old. Uh, Liberty here weighs about 42 pounds. Is that all? Yep, and he made it here by private coach, of course, Black Stretch uh, Escalade. And uh, took a, about three days, you know, so we like to give them time to stretch their legs and everything so that they're comfortable. But I would have thought they'd take the gravy train. I know, yeah, exactly, right? Um, 20 weeks. 20 weeks. And how did you pick the two to bring to Washington? So it's a great question. So our team of live production professionals that work with them every day are just really making observations. Uh, you know, are they easily agitated? Are they... Uh, are, are they uh, uh, Anytime they hear a loud noise, for instance, we're wanting to acclimate them. We let them listen to a lot of music. I can confirm they are Swifties, and they do enjoy some prints now and then. Really? Well, yeah, yeah. they're from Minnesota, I would hope so. Yeah, lots of different toys for them to interact with, and, and then they just make observations uh, as to their behavior, and we want them to feel comfortable and confident, and, and you see them strutting accordingly. So they've now been pardoned. Yes. Is this a lifetime pardon or is this a one-year pardon? No, it's a lifetime pardon, so they're going to spend their the rest of their days at the University of Minnesota at what they call their College for Food and Egg Sciences, otherwise known as CFANS. And so they're going to make their way back to Minnesota here, leaving sometime later today, actually. And they live out their life they reading, may, just Maybe they'll out. catch wow. a hockey game, you know, hang out with Goldie the Gopher. <laughs> Now they, as you can imagine, so they'll have uh, veterinary students there and faculty. They'll have the very best possible care, and they'll probably get to meet some new people as well. Speaking of presidential holiday traditions, the 2023 White House Christmas tree has arrived in Washington, D.C. The 18 and a half foot Fraser fir comes from Fleetwood, North Carolina. It was greeted at the White House Monday by First Lady Jill Biden and U.S. military families. The first known White House Christmas tree was set up back in 1889. The first to have electric lights on it was in 1894. Officials say this year's White House tree will be placed in the famed Blue Room. Well, that does it for today. You're streaming CBS News. I'm Nancy Cordes. Thanks for watching.